Hi everybody, welcome back to Sam IT. I'm Scott Allen Miller and today we're going to answer what is this virtualization shortlist for 2018 and specifically for the SMB market, small and medium sized businesses. There are remaining after 2017 four key virtualization products for the enterprise market. Now we're talking about servers here, we're not talking about things you might use on your desktop or in a lab, we're talking about actual enterprise production deployment systems. Those four are VMware's ESXi, KVM, Zen, and Microsoft's Hyper-V. Those four constitute the entire enterprise market going into 2018. And for all intents, for all practical uh, chances, there's no way that a fifth contender is going to enter the market in the next year. Generally, a virtualization contender will have years of time that we will see them arriving uh, towards the market in lab and other environments as they get tested before they reach the market. So we can safely assume even by 2019, there's almost no chance that a new contender will arise and very little reason for one to. In a market such as this, it's rare to have a need for more than three vendors. And there's four sort of with virtualization. Technically, there's actually only three vendors. Zen and KVM are actually made by the Linux Foundation together. And so while they compete with each other at a product level, there is only three vendors bringing out core products. But there's a lot of vendors that use those to make other things on top. So we may see the market as saturated with way too many vendors, but under the hood, there's actually only three. Technically, the BSD world is attempting to bring their own Beehive product to market, but that's going to be quite some time before we start looking at that in production, maybe by 2020, and we don't know if it's going to be needed or have any market pressure uh, to advance to that point. But we'll see as time goes on, but it's not going to be a player in 2018. Now, of those four, obviously four is a lot, and for shortlisting, we don't really want to deal with that many. There's one choice here that's, that clearly stands out as different than the others, and that is VMware ESXi. Of all four of these products, three of them are completely free and unencumbered. You may use them in any capacity that you want, to any scale that you want. There is zero licensing involved. And one, ESXi, does not work that way. It does come in a free version, but that free version is heavily crippled and comes with so few features that realistically, under normal circumstances, we would never consider it where we would consider the others. You, there are some reasons to consider VMware ESXi, and we have another video that I did a couple weeks ago that delve into that, and I recommend you watch that if you want to know where to make the, uh, the exception and include that in your shortlist. But by and large, you're not going to start with ESXi on your list at all. Simply rule it out and move on. If you have really special needs, you would have brought it in. Of the three remaining, we already have a short list, three major players, but we probably want to eliminate one of them under normal circumstances. And sadly, because it's kind of my favorite, mostly because it's the granddaddy and the one I've been working with for decades, Zen has to be kicked out. It's not that Zen isn't a great product, it is. It has some of the best technology, it has by far the most maturity, it is still doing amazing things in the market, but it has the most problems getting to where the average SMB is going to be able to use it today. It is fully usable, and if you are using it, or want to use it anyway, there's a reason why I kept it on the top three, but it's clearly number three. And if you want to quickly eliminate another one, it's the one that has to go. If you do want Want to use it, what's really important to understand in 2018 is that towards, well, throughout 2017, the major package of Zen, which is Zen Server, this is important, they are not the same thing. Zen is the underlying hypervisor, Zen Server is a distribution based on it. Zen Server has always been pretty heavily crippled compared to Zen itself. It's always a bit behind in technology. A lot of features are removed, such as fault tolerance. A lot of the ecosystem features are removed, such as uh, clustered uh, high availability storage. And it is then encumbered with a lot of extra things, which are sometimes beneficial and sometimes detrimental. But more importantly, Zen Server has been on a slow decline. And in the very last month or two, it has been severely crippled and doesn't look like it has a really strong path forward. So Zen Server, having dropped out of the race, and it's worth noting, Amazon has mostly dropped its support for Zen. Zen doesn't have the strong future that it used to. It's likely going to be around for a long time to come because it has some really amazing technology and history, and it is very likely going to be reinventing itself for more niche case uses where it's going to be very strong, but very limited. 
and it will continue to play some amount of role in private clouds, but that will likely diminish over time too. So if you want to keep using Zen, by all means, it probably means that you're going to have to do a little bit more effort on your own, but if you're highly skilled and technical or just willing to, to dive in and spend a little bit more time on it, Zen can be a very rewarding ecosystem with a lot of special features to offer to you, and hopefully even more in the future. I have high hopes that Zen will either be making a major comeback on its own, or that somehow they will find a way to merge a lot of its features into KVM and create a merged product and that would kind of be ideal to eliminate the uh, competition in the space, as we do have one too many players. Of the two remaining, we have got two great choices, Hyper-V by Microsoft and KVM from the Linux Foundation. Of these, we actually end up with a pretty tough choice, and this is where you may want to sit down and spend a lot of time evaluating which makes sense for you. A common misconception is that Hyper-V makes sense when you run one, want to run Windows workloads and that KVM would be for Linux workloads. In reality, KVM was heavily tuned specifically for the Windows world because it came from a land where it was heavily competing with Zen, which was heavily tuned for the Linux world. So KVM actually, in many circumstances, is the superior product specifically for Windows users. KVM also has the surprising benefit of generally being quite a bit simpler to use than Hyper-V. That catches a lot of people off guard, but if you're a Windows user and you want something that's really simple and really meant for your use case, KVM may, may be the actual better fit for you. Hyper-V has a tendency to be targeted quite a bit more at larger shops where they're expecting you to have a more complex Windows ecosystem, not just Windows products, but a Windows ecosystem with Active Directory and possibly SSCM, uh, so that you're going to use that for your centralized management. Or you're going to need to turn to uh, third-party management tools like Five9, which is not free, and that limits your ecosystem quite a bit, whereas KVM is going to be able to do all those same things things completely for free. Now, Hyper-V does have some benefits that are worth mentioning, and the most significant ones are its incredibly tight integration with products like Starwind, which is important because it's free and delivers uh, everything that's needed to build uh, SMB scaled high availability solutions and because of its tight integration with players like uh, Unitrends and Veeam and Restaurantix, who are able to deliver uh, really heavily integrated backup solutions that leverage the APIs directly from Hyper-V. These things are big strengths in the Hyper-V world. That said, backup APIs like that are not the end all of backups, and we'll cover more of that in more videos about backups and backup concepts and whether they really make sense. So while it's a benefit, it may not be one that tips the scales. And players like Starwind are making a big effort to be on KVM as well, and Starwind, for example, already is. They're just not as tightly integrated yet as they are in Hyper-V. So as you move forward, you may find that Hyper-V is playing a pretty strong hand against Hyper-V, uh, but uh, did I say that right? KVM versus Hyper-V, but Hyper-V also has a really strong product. Both of them are solid and very enterprise ready and able to handle anything you're going to throw at them, and it will be tough to choose. It is worth noting, if you're going to work with Hyper-V, you either need to have an Active Directory domain and you're going to be managing your systems from Windows 10, and you need all of that to have the tools that you need, or you're going to have to get third-party tools. Uh, or if you're going to go to a work group and not put your Hyper-V into a domain, you end up jumping through a lot of hoops to make things work. It can be done, but it makes it a lot more challenging and fragile, and these are things that are a big pain, uh, unless you want to manage completely through PowerShell, which you certainly can, and there's reasons why that may make sense. Hyper-V also has the negatives of being a highly confusing ecosystem, and the average deployment actually has a lot of flaws because people didn't understand how Hyper-V worked, how its licensing worked, how its licensing interplayed with the workloads we're running on top of it, things that in theory should be pretty simple, but for some reason the Hyper-V ecosystem has engendered a lot of confusion and myths, and those things are causing a lot of problems for them. In KVM, things tend to be a lot simpler. Uh, even though the actual technology isn't simpler, it's simply that the ecosystem around it has made a better understanding of how it works uh, in relation to the actual technology and to the licensing and its interrelationship with other components. Uh, but if you're going to do things like backups on KVM, currently there isn't change block tracking and there's no backup API, so you're going to be working with traditional agents. But in many cases, you'd be doing this on Hyper-V anyway, so it's not a big deal. And even if it's not exactly what you want, it's certainly functional and does what you need. 
there is a reason why KVM is the number one choice when other vendors are building uh, hypervisors into their own products. It's incredibly powerful, incredibly mature, and it is where the biggest focus of the industry development is going on. Look for really great things coming from KVM itself and the KVM ecosystem over time. We are certainly seeing a lot of things happening under the hood at the storage layer as players want to get KVM to where they need it so that it can kind of take off. And the reason that a lot of vendors are interested in KVM is because KVM is free and unencumbered. So as a third party vendor, you have a lot of reason to be tied to KVM, whereas with Hyper-V, you have a lot more risk being tied with them, even though right now their SMB market share is a little bit bigger. But going forward, there's a good chance that KVM is going to be a big player to consider. But both of those two are really good options, and you just need to see what fits best for your particular needs. Of course, if you have questions about it, you can put them in the thread below and ask there, and people will be certainly happy to talk to you about their feelings on KVM versus Hyper-V or some of the others in the ecosystem if you have special needs that maybe one of them meets better. Remember to like and subscribe, please. And as always, we have a link to Patreon in the comments where you can help sponsor our talks like this. Thanks for joining me. Discover how easy and affordable business telephone service can be. Say it with Talkadillo.